and welcome to Life at the Met. A programme showcasing the talents and accomplishments of our students at Belfast Metropolitan College. I'm Stephen Greer. And I'm Laura McConnell. Coming up on today's show. From the first week of term at the Freshers' Fair to getting your diploma at graduation, what to expect on the student journey through college life. We'll take a look at the issue of homelessness and how Belfast Met has been getting involved. And it's never too early to plan ahead, so if you're thinking of returning to study, we'll give you all the details of how to apply next year. Well, life at the college is busy from the offset, with many events taking place to help new students settle in. Freshers' Week is one of the first. It's an opportunity for students to bond and see what the college life is all about. It takes place across all campuses with fun activities like climbing walls, food tasting and there's also help and advice on hand about studies. Throughout the year there's ongoing support and information events. We have a jobs fair. This allows students to focus on career prospects and even get some part-time work to help them through their studies. And a volunteering fair with opportunities for experiences or even internships to boost your CV or personal statement. And of course, the big finale for students, graduation. On the day, there is lots of glitz and glamour with students wearing their cap and gowns, receiving their awards and showing off all their hard work. Another momentous occasion for one student was being elected as student president. All of our students get to vote for president and their role is to represent the student body and their interests on the student council. And I'm delighted that this year's student president, Louise Meek, joins us now along with former Belfast Met student Ricky Thompson, who graduated a few years back and is now a journalist for UTV. So Ricky, you've been there, done that. Were you involved in any student activities at your time at the Met? Uh, yes, uh, particularly I remember the Freshers' Week um, when I first started. Uh, there were loads of activities set up for the day across uh, the campuses in Belfast. And they included things like there was music in the canteen. You could go and, you know, while you're eating your lunch, you just uh, listen to this live band playing, which was, uh, was good. And there were other activities. I remember Zorbing being one of them. It was set up uh, at the Millfield campus. It had this big uh, sort of slanty bouncy castle type thing and you would go to the top of it and roll down and you'd be strapped inside this, this big ball zorb and uh, you'd just be pushed down and you'd roll down at speed. That was um, pretty, pretty fun I suppose. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a bit of a break between your uh, normal classes. Yeah. Um, and uh, other activities, there were sort of sporting events going on and uh, other little um, you know, tables with small activities as well. So uh, they, all, you know, they do try to get as many things packed into the Freshers' Week as possible. Yeah, there's definitely something for everyone there. Um, would you be able to tell us about the opportunities you had whilst you were at the Met? Yes, opportunities at the Met, uh, I had plenty of them and I tried to take advantage of as many of them as possible. Uh, Doing journalism, there's so many things in terms of interviewing various people and things are set up for you. We were able to go to Stormont and um, interview a panel of politicians. We were able to ask them anything we wanted, so that was obviously a lot of fun for a lot of people. And we got some controversial responses out of the politicians themselves as well, uh, which, was, which is always good. Um, also, my year, we were, there was a trip organised to Spr Strasbourg through the EU uh, to France which was amazing for all the students involved. Obviously, um, everything, you know, you go out there, everything's paid for. You get a tour around the European Parliament and you get the interview, uh, one or two students got the interview and MEP as well. So there's massive opportunities involved. And when it comes to uh, putting yourself out there, work experience is one of the most important things that you can do. And that can be set up by lectures at the Met as well. And myself, I was one of the uh, lucky ones. I got into Cool FM downtown during my time at the Met, which was amazing and that, has, that was a springboard for me and pushing me into my career that I have now. Great. Um, were you involved um, with the Paul Robinson bursary competition? I was, yes. It's a, a great competition. Uh, I, I believe Paul Robinson was a, a BBC journalist and it was set up in his name after he died. Uh, it involves students putting in pieces uh, of work. It can be a radio piece or a, a video piece, possibly print as well. And it involves you uh, sort of competing against your fellow journalists, which is a bit of fun as well, but you have to put together a, a, you know, a professional piece and submit it and the winner gets, there's a cash prize, but also um, work experience at the BBC and I managed to uh, get joint uh, first prize in that, which was amazing for me and getting the experience in the BBC uh, again was uh, just invaluable. Yeah, that's amazing. Could you tell us about the experience you've had after you've left the Met? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, I started in Cool FM in downtown at the same time I was there. I also started in the Belfast Telegraph and the Sunday Life. And I began my work there 
I was going through that as well as being at the Met and after that I carried that on and that's one of the most important things I think is sticking to what you've been doing and just pushing through it. After that I was able to get a, a job as a freelance video journalist for the Belfast Telegraph's website which um, brought me right through uh, eight, or eight months or so uh, until I was able to get a job at UTV and Obviously, that's that's the pinnacle for me so far. You know, I had always imagined working at UTV. I didn't think it would happen so soon for me, and it's been fantastic for me that I have been able to to do that, and I've been able to bring all the experience up to that point to make me uh, perform in that job as well as I can, I suppose. And the way student president is a big responsibility. Tell us a bit more about your role. You're right, Steve. It is a big responsibility. My role is obviously to voice the students' opinions. I'm the representation of the student body, and this, the role of the students' council is to have you know students come in with their problems or concerns, and we obviously bring them into the board for them to be discussed and to be solved. What made you want to run for president? Well, I've always been involved in like student life, especially at my old school, and I felt that this was a role that I could definitely, you know, put myself into. Um, I'm all for, you know, young people and working with young people, and I think that I was probably the best person to work with young people. And obviously, this is your first year at Belfast Met, but if you had any advice for someone who was maybe sitting at home thinking of applying and really wanted to be student president, what would you? What advice would you give them? Well. I would probably give them the advice of, you know, make a good campaign, have key points of like what you want to raise within Belfast Met and how to improve the skill itself. I think that's extremely important. And how did you run your campaign? Well, actually, I created a leaflet on different points that um, I believed in. For example, I'm a representative of the LGBT community and of women's rights. So that was definitely a strong campaign um, standpoint for me. Do you have any goals for your term as president this year? Well, actually, this year is really important between the staff and the student. We actually have done a couple of workshops around that and how we're going to improve the relationship between the two. Also, obviously, that we would like to improve on certain courses within the Belfast Met. So how do you balance your studies and the student council? Well, I have to admit it is quite a challenge, but I think it's just um, working on, you know, time frames and things like that you know we have meetings um once a month in belfast met so it's easy for us to you know okay this is where we are and this is where we're going whereas when class we have certain deadlines which i can work around too and ricky did you um develop any skills or learn any new skills that you've now can use in your everyday life absolutely i mean whenever you're on the uh, the hnd broadcast journalism course you do so many different topics you work through so many different things that you're bound to be using those whenever you're in your working life, particularly the legal side of things. Uh, you, you know, studying media law and things like that, that helps you massively in the real world. On a daily basis when I'm sitting in work, what I do is upload copy to the website, the UTV website. So I'm getting lots of things coming through to me. There's court reports, there's emails, just loads of sources that come to me and I have to decide what to put up and if I can put it up. If there's something that's legally contentious and straight back I, in my head, I go to what I learned on my HND course and other courses and it tells me instantly that's not okay I can't put that in so everything can come back to what you learnt while you were studying so it is really really important. And Rick if you don't mind me saying you didn't just leave the Belfast Met with an HND? Uh, no I didn't I also left with a fiance <laughs> uh, we met each other on uh, on our course the HND course obviously uh, that was five years ago now we're still together and uh, hopefully we will be married at some point in the future. <laughs> well it's great to hear from the two of you um, on your plans for the future. I'd like to thank both you Louise and Ricky for coming here today. Belfast Met is a part of the wider community so we encourage our students to get involved in activities outside of their studies such as raising awareness for homelessness. Earlier this year some of our students did a sponsored sleep out. Let's see how they got on. The reason they came up with to do the homeless sleep out was because there's people, like, you've ever seen you're walking through town and stuff, like Castle Street for example, and you see people lying there, and they're in a bad way and you feel, you feel a bit of pity for them. And there's also a person from, from our line where I'm from, and uh, he used to be a footballer, like, he was good at football, and he was just a handsome looking guy, and now uh, he's just, he drinks and he's homeless, and it's, it's mad the way can, the things can just go so fast. My uncle was homeless, so he was homeless for a couple of months, and it made us realise that it was hard for him and then he got he got um back on his feet and got himself a wee house and 
you know, it's hard for, for the enemies to sleep, you know, sleep rough in the street. What we've done was got, raise some money uh, so we could do a homeless sleep out in BMC Car Park to raise awareness for, for homeless people. The reason why we did it is because we wanted to experience how the homeless slept um, rough on the street and it, was a good, it would be a good experience for us all. Well that was earlier on this year. Joining us now is Jerry Skelton, social work lecturer from the Met, Declan Morris from the Simon Community and Grace Price, former service user. Declan, how important is it to raise awareness for homelessness? I think it's massively important to, to raise the issue of, of homelessness and, 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 and raise people's level of education and awareness about it. I suppose like many situations in society and situations that involve people and people who, who, who struggle with, with poverty or, 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 or things that happen within society that have a negative impact on their lives, it's important that we don't ignore that. Um, and as best as we possibly can, as I say, raise the level of education and awareness to as many people as possible about the issue of homelessness because sometimes, and more often than not, it's an image that is not understood. Um, it's an image that perhaps uh, has created a stereotype over the years and it's important that we look at all the facts and look at all the figures surrounding homelessness, not just in Belfast but Northern Ireland and, and, and wider afield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. How does the Simon community help? The Simon community helps in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, certainly historically the Simon community has, has been known for its supported accommodation or, or hostel provision um, across Northern Ireland and that helps to, to support people who find themselves without a home and, and, and therefore require supported accommodation and support to find themselves a route back into society and, and back into independent living. Uh, but we offer support in many other different ways as well. Um, we can, a big move for us recently has been around homelessness prevention. So it's actually trying to prevent homelessness before it actually happens. So we have branched out and offered a variety of different services, in particular one that supports people in their own homes to sustain their life in the community that they live in uh, and prevent them from ending up in hostile life. Uh, we've made that easier for people to access through our 24 hour, seven day a week helpline um, that people can phone um, uh, for advice or support, or if indeed they need support at home um, and we can put that in place. And as well as that we have our, our own homeless prevention uh, program uh, which looks at a variety of different initiatives that works collaboratively with local services to provide easier access to the supports that people might need who find themselves homeless or at risk of homelessness. Not least the likes of services that help with welfare advice and um, housing advice, uh, training, education, employment opportunities um, like the Belfast Met and, and other issues like that. And Jerry, you've been running the Homeless Awareness Panel in Belfast Met since 2007, mm -hmm. annually during Homeless Awareness Week, and I believe you were shortlisted for an award. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Steve. What is your motivation and what have the events achieved? Motivation is driven out of a sense of passion about wanting to try. of one agenda, Stephen. It's to change the world and make it a better place for all of us. So we start thinking about homelessness. If I was to ask the viewers to this program, or indeed yourself, to maybe take out a bunch of keys that you have to your house or whatever it is, the most important key that we often take for granted is the key to a door that lets us into a home. And without our key to our door, home becomes something that impacts our identity. If we have no home, it's very hard then to start thinking about who we are as people. And yet we take this for granted all the time. A lot of us, my good colleague Declan, one of the best homeless prevention people in Northern Ireland, I have to say, and they had a campaign running and I think we're about three pay packets away from being homeless and I'd say it's probably one now in terms of the economic situation that we're in. So I, like other people, Declan and Grace and others and yourself included, want to try and make a difference in people's lives that maybe have a bit of a voice for those who are marginalised, isolated, excluded and also my professional backgrounds lend themselves to that in terms of social work and youth work and things like that. I, I often argue and I'm on record of saying that maybe the professions don't take homelessness as seriously as they should or they could and that's one of the reasons I set up the panel in 2007 really to provoke originally the social work profession to try and take homelessness seriously and then widen that. I mean we're in a studio here one of my issues was around how we report homelessness how we tend to feed the taboo, the stereotype, the prejudice that then flows from that and if there's one message I want people to know from this is there are no homeless people I know it might sound controversial there are people who are homeless what have the events achieved? 
Well, um, obviously it's probably not for me to say, you know, but I'd like to think they've made a difference. Um, in ter this certainly helps shape the discourse around homelessness. Um, there's a, one of my colleagues would say, if you're ever on an event, here's the thing she must never say when Jerry's around. <laughs> Homeless people, disabled people, alcoholic, all of those sort of things. We have to start with the human being, person first, never a label. So we've had some impact on the discourse. I'm really pleased to say that um, because of the campaigning, that, and thank you for mentioning the award, that was lovely. But what's more important to me is that Social Work now, from 2016, have placed homelessness on the Social Work curriculum. So every Social Work student is going to have to address homelessness. And if we address it in the teaching, and in the education, and in their training, then that translates immediately into practice. So no Social Worker can say to me what was said before, what's homelessness got to do with the helping professions? And Jerry, what support do you feel is necessary for those who are homeless or find them themselves on the brink of being homeless? I, I suppose that we talk about um, organisations have a duty of care. I'd like people to start with a duty to care, so that would be really lovely. Um, homelessness itself, if we had more time we could talk about the definition. Part of my background is social work and anybody who's in the care system is homeless. We just don't call it homelessness, we call it in care, foster care, adoption, residential care, whatever that is. So we need to start with an understanding. Homelessness impacts anybody and can impact quite a lot of people. There's no respecter of gender, age, financial circumstances. Any of us, as I was saying earlier, could end up homeless because of a whole range of things. I'd love the media to be reporting it properly, ethically, doing it well, thoughtfully and feelingfully because we keep sort of feeding that whole media, that the myth around that stereotype. Um, and that's one of the reasons I invite media, journalists, students, etc., etc., to come to the Homeless Awareness Panel, to let them hear what the story is, to let them hear from professionals like Declan, um, service users and former service users like Grace, people like myself who've been working in the homeless sector, to hear what's important, what matters, and how can we provide services that are sensitive in the first instance. We're also at a time now in terms of austerity, now, I think we confuse the word austerity with severity, and I think that's really what's happening. But in terms of that, so there's not an awful lot of public support, really, for people who are homeless. That becomes an issue. Our numbers are increasing, not because of the issue itself, but we have other issues, migration, terrorism, lots of things that feed into this. So we have loads of people now, and we need those services sensitive to it. But that makes a big demand on the public purse. And that's a whole issue for all of us in terms of, well, how do we prioritise that? over other things in a massively competing agenda. And Grace, how has events such as Jerry's Homeless Awareness Panel um, helped not only you, but others? Well, I've found it's helped me because it's a number of years since I've been homeless. And once I was homeless, there wasn't as much support then of different organisations, and there's a lot more now. Plus, Jerry's events gives people like me a voice and let people out there know what people who have been homeless or are homeless are just like anyone else, are human beings and are just want to be treated like people and it's also a matter of people may be homeless but they have other problems as well and not just to pick and choose or who you can help or oh, that person's just homeless but then they could have other problems and they don't want to help them because of the other problems they have and it's too much for them to help them and not to segregate or one just do so, so much for people because they're homeless but if that person has uh, self-harm problems or drug pro problems on top of that or oh, don't want to help them because that's more of a problem yeah. it's just the same as a standard person there mm -hmm. and it's just the person has a voice and the person just needs help because nobody knows how it could happen to you any time mm -hmm. definitely this shine a light on a huge issue but thank you grace declan and jerry for thank joining you. us here today thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, if you've been affected by any of the issues that we've just brought up, there is support out there, like the Simon community and our college website, if you ever find yourself on the brink of being homeless or are indeed homeless. Our final guest today is Jim Woods, Head of Learner Success. Welcome, Jim, to the studio. Um, we just have been hearing there about uh, homelessness and how some students can maybe find themselves, through no fault of their own, in that situation where they've nowhere to live. Can the college offer support? Yeah, the college is all about widening participation and increasing participation. So we would have a number of students who apply at the beginning of the year who are homeless. And indeed, some students become homeless during the year. And we have a very dedicated support mechanism in place. The Belfast Met Trust has actually joined with the college 
in funding a specific response to that, who's Clayton Stewart in the Centre for Inclusive Learning. So when you contact Clayton, you will get one-to-one -one support. If I could maybe give you an example, we had somebody in just two weeks ago who had been referred by one of our tutors. The chap came along and he met Clayton on site, felt a little bit uncomfortable. They moved over to the Doc Cafe off site. He spent about 45 minutes with him. He established what some of his needs were, what his trials and tribulations were. Um, as a result of that conversation, Clayton then got onto the phone and he phoned the housing executive, some of the local housing associations and the Simon community. He then took him up to our student support, uh, student financial support, and we got an application in for the hardship fund to support him through his course. And finally then he was able to hook him up with a mentor who will support him through the initial weeks of his course to make sure he stays on track and give him some support with his learning. So there's a real holistic effort on behalf of the college to support people from a homeless background and to make sure we set them on their way and treat them like every other student so as they aren't disadvantaged. And Jim, we've just started a brand new academic year. It seems strange to be talking about next year's course, but what would be the first steps for new students? Yeah, our applications for September next year open on the 30th of January with a Parent Information Day, which is held in the Titanic Quarter Building. We have about 6,000 full-time students on an annual basis, and it is quite difficult to leave everything to the last minute. So we get people to apply online for a course, and the first thing that they really must do is try and home in an area that they want to work in or that they want to progress and further study, and then they can apply for up to five courses. Now, part of the commitment that the student will undertake is to attend a pre-entry advice and guidance session if they then come to that and have the necessary criteria to get onto the course, we revert back to date of application. So it's critically important to apply as early as you can. 30th of January is a big bang day on a Saturday. We have all the lecturing staff there, the parents call down, and it's always a big event for the college to open applications. Can you say about criteria there, how will a student actually know if they've been accepted onto a course? The, the, well, first of all, the, the criteria is laid down in our published prospectus and on our website, but the student will be invited along to a pre-entry advice and guidance session as part of their commitment. Um, they would then put them in as a place if they have the existing qualifications, or they would make them an offer if they're waiting for the appropriate qualifications come August time, or indeed they may put them on a waiting list. So we would keep in contact with the student regularly from the date of application through to August when we actually enrol the students and they have secured the results. And what can the college do if someone applies late, say for example, or even waits until results day until they know what they want to do? Yeah, I, I mean, at the college we would uh, encourage people to apply really early to give them the maximum number of choices available. We do have a lot of applicants who, when the results come out, maybe don't end up in the course in university that they think they'd want to get to and will turn to the college. At that time, we would have a reduced number of choices for, for the person, but we will still be taking applications up until towards the end of August. We also have a clearing day for HE and for FE courses, where we take people directly onto courses where there are places available. But the key message, I think, for learners is to get your application in early, even to have a contingency plan. I'm sure there's a number of courses at different levels. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, I mean, the Belfast Metropolitan College is the largest provider of further and higher education in Ireland. We have sev over 700 courses um, and we, we will enrol about 6,000 full-time learners next September and about 15,000 part-time. Courses are arranged in levels, so a level not level one is a basic return to very general education and we would have about 200 full-time people doing that. Level two is equivalent to GCSE and we have a number of vocational courses in that area and they would tend to be specific to an employment area. We have about 2,500 learners at level 3, which is equivalent to A-levels, and you would usually progress to employment from there, or indeed to higher education courses in the college or one of our local universities. On addition to that, we have 1,400 um, full-time higher education courses that the Belfast Metropolitan College delivers in its own right, and that would take people on to further higher education, and again with a big focus on vocational education and employment. Jim Woods, thanks for joining us. And just a reminder of those key dates. We have the part-time information day on the 7th of January 2016. As courses are offered on a first-come, first-served basis, you must get your applications in early. 
If you are not sure on what you want to do, come along to our Parents' Day on the 30th of January or even our Open Day on the 4th of February. The College accepts applications on all of these dates. Well, that's all we have time for on today's show. But we would like to thank all of our guests for coming along and, of course, you for watching at home. And remember, if you want any more information on Belfast Met, you can do so by visiting our website, belfastmet.ac.uk, or watch some of our episodes coming up in the next few months of Life at the Met. But until next time, goodbye. goodbye.